I'm going to try something a little different in my sermon today. At least I hope it's a little different. I'm going to preach about something that I know hardly anything about. Uh, I'm not talking about the Bible, although I wouldn't say that I'm an expert on the Bible. I have pl spent plenty of time reading and studying it. Uh, and reading and studying it for this sermon, and I will be talking about the Bible in this sermon, but I'm going to be talking about a game, a game which I have never played. Now, unlike softball, which is in the Bible, because we hear about in the big inning, <laughs> and tennis, which is in the Bible because Joseph served in Pharaoh's court, Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about golf, which is not mentioned in the Bible. This sermon is number four in a series of five on the book of Acts. We've talked about Jesus' promise to his disciples to send them the power of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost allowing each person gathered to hear about God's deeds of power in their own language. Last week, I shared the story of Peter and Cornelius and how Peter, a faithful Jew and follower of Jesus, had a conversion experience. Peter is now a faithful Jew who has had his vision of the church expanded to include the possibility of non-Jewish believers. And he's a follower of Jesus who is willing to accept Cornelius, a Roman centurion, as a brother in Christ. It is Peter's words which we heard from Acts 11 today, and Peter is including possibilities which the church had never considered before. Some of you may remember this logo, it's been a visual reference for the past three weeks, and it's still posted out in the gathering area if you want a closer look. The book of Acts is a record of the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the apostles and the first converts to Christianity. It is the Holy Spirit that created the church and directed its mission and vision. And sometimes, that mission created disagreement and tension. Remember last week that I pointed out that the word change is part of this cloud of words which surround possibility. There was, there were certain, and change is an inevitable part of possibility, whether we name it or not. Now, there were certainly outside pressures on the church, on this new church. There was persecution, imprisonment, even the martyrdom of one of the church's first leaders. But Acts, chapters 10 through 15, beginning with Peter's vision that we talked about last week and culminating with the Council of Jerusalem, are focused on the internal struggles of the church and how it dealt with creating the possibility of change. These were huge and hotly contested decisions for the church, decisions which set the course for the rest of Christian history. And that is why I want to talk about golf today. What we talk about determines what we focus on. What we focus on determines what we imagine. What we imagine determines what we do. And what we do determines our future. Athletes know that there's a mental as well as a physical component to their training and performance. Studies have repeatedly proven that a positive approach leads to better performance. Mental rehearsing involves visualizing successful performance and rehearsing it in your mind. And the athlete who introduced this to a wide audience was golfer Jack Nicklaus in a book he wrote called Golf My Way. 
instead of focusing on avoiding mistakes by thinking, don't slice it or don't hit it into the trees. Nicholas said that 50% of hitting a specific shot came from the mental image he formed during the setup. When he was asked how he got to be such a successful putter, he said, I have never missed a putt in my mind. You may have heard the phrase self-fulfilling prophecy. It means that what we expect is what we get because it's the reality that we create for ourselves. If we expect people to be negative, then we respond to them defensively, and then they're negative. Our projection of what other people think actually creates the reality which we experience. And when that projection is negative, nobody ever listens to me, I don't think I can do this, nobody cares about me, that creates a downward spiral that Ben Zander talked about in the video that some of you saw last week. It made me think of this Far Side cartoon by cartoonist Gary Larson. I hope you can read it. It's titled, Roger Screws Up. It is uh, the name Roger, I didn't put that in there, it could have been any of us. But here's the man in the back of the orchestra holding one cymbal saying, I won't mess up, I won't mess up, I won't mess up. Okay, I think it's funny. <laughs> it could be any of us who are so focused on not messing up that we have already sabotaged our chances of success. And believe me, I speak from personal experience here because nothing derails a sermon quicker than thinking, oh, I hope I can do this. Not only that, thinking, oh, I hope I can do this, does not honor the work of the Holy Spirit in our preparation for this process. I'm sure uh, visualizing success is not a substitute for preparation. I'm sure Jack Nicholas hit plenty of practice putts, but getting rid of stinking thinking, which focuses on what might go wrong instead of what could go right, is a significant change in focus. Creating possibility by imagining the best from ourselves, those around us, and our organization is not just a good idea. But I would note it is a good idea that costs us nothing except the effort to monitor our own thinking and speaking. I do believe that positive creating possibility is a theological imperative. And by that, I mean something that God wants us to do. Because creating possibility for ourselves and for others is the way in which God sees us. Now, that's pretty amazing when you think about it because God knows us pretty well. God knows the ways that we have messed up the ways that we have been stupid and hurtful and selfish and sinful. And God knows that sometimes we're not even sorry about that. God knows that there are people who are happy to live their lives as if God doesn't exist. People who may not even believe that God exists. God still loves those people. And we are all those people. Who are we to think that we can judge where God does not? I'm going to use another golf metaphor. This is from a book which I discovered in the Creekside Library. I'd read it before, but it 
kind of literally fell in my lap last week when I was filing some books. It's called The Mulligan by Ken Blanchard and Wally Armstrong. Here's a definition. A mulligan is, in friendly play, permission granted a golfer by other golfers to retake a flubbed shot, especially the first shot of the game. This second chance shot is not allowed in the official rules of golf. And a mulligan, my friends, is one of the best ways I've found to understand the book of Acts and the ministry to the Gentiles. The official rules of Judaism had become paralyzed. Either people checked out of the game entirely, or they were so busy trying to track the fine print that they were walking around thinking, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up. Or there were Pharisees who made it their business to see how other people were breaking the rules. You, wrong, wrong, wrong. God changed that game. Now that doesn't mean there are no rules any longer and that we can do whatever we want. That would be chaos. No one could play that game. What God did is create the possibility that we could still be part of the game, even if we're not perfect. God gave us the promise of success rather than the condemnation of failure. And that gift is grace the gift which is offered to each one of us because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was the only perfect person. He never even missed a putt. And here's the good news of Christ's grace. Not that we can be perfect, because we can't be, but that we are freed from the tyranny of other people's expectations and free to live into the possibility of who God created us to be. That is what God wants for each one of us. And because Jesus, of Jesus Christ, we can get as many mulligans as we need to help us get there. The good news we can share with others is that Jesus died for them, God loves them, and we're not going to invent rules where God offers grace. Jesus didn't just give us a second chance. Jesus offers the possibility of freedom from the downward spiral of negativity and failure where we imprison other people and ourselves. Peter, God bless Peter, he's so great about admitting when he doesn't get it the first time. In this passage that we heard from Acts 11, he's talking to fellow Jewish Christians in Acts 11. And these folks are pretty skeptical about including Gentiles in the church. Peter tells them about his vision and how he met Cornelius and how he went back to Caesarea to talk to the members of Cornelius' household. Yeah, the apostles are not having any of that. After all, this is changing their understanding of thousands of years of Jewish law about who's in and who's out. They are not to, about to give all those Gentiles a mulligan at the very beginning of the game. And Peter says, as I spoke to Cornelius' household at Caesarea, I saw the Holy Spirit fall upon them. Just like it fell on us at Pentecost. And I remembered the words of John the Baptist who said, I will baptize with fire, but Jesus, I will baptize with water, but Jesus Christ will baptize with fire. And that's when I realized if God has given the Gentiles the same gift that he gave to us, 
Who am I to stand in the way of the Holy Spirit? It's this aha moment for the apostles, and they are silenced. I take it by your silence that you agree. I believe that the Holy Spirit, which is woven throughout the book of the Acts of the Apostles, is the power of possibility. It's the power to be open to the possibilities that the Spirit has for our lives, and also the power to create possibility for other people, to live into God's will for their lives. Who are we to stand in the way of the Holy Spirit? We ought to be in the business of creating goals, of seeing visions and dreaming dreams that challenge us to succeed for the sake of the kingdom. We ought to be anticipating and expecting the best from one another. We ought to be handing out mulligans right and left because we need to break the spirals of negativity which sap our energy and leave us discouraged and keep us fixated on how we have messed up instead of freeing us to live into the possibilities which God has for us. I got an email this week that made my day. Uh, it was from somebody at Creekside and it wasn't somebody who I felt had been critical of me, but it was still a mulligan of sorts. I shared a phrase with you at the beginning of this series, and it was great to have someone send it back to me. It was like, I don't know, like someone had listened to something that I had said. Here's the phrase, maybe some of you will remember it. If it isn't fantastic, that's because God isn't finished. Remember that? If it isn't fantastic, that's because God isn't finished. We serve an awesome God who has great plans for us. We have been given the grace of Jesus Christ who died so that we could be free from our sin. We are promised the power of the Holy Spirit to create possibilities for God's mission and vision to proclaim the kingdom of God. And if it isn't fantastic, God isn't finished. Amen.